now in the wake of the attempted Christmas Day terror attack, you would think the spies at the CIA that they would have their hands full securing America. But believe it or not, assets at Langley are being used for other projects. A stunning report from the New York Times reveals that CIA manpower and satellites are actually monitoring, get this, climate change. The Pentagon has released reports that say that, uh, that climate change uh, poses a risk to national security. I'm wondering if, if this, is that something you agree with? I have looked at some of the Pentagon information, and I personally think it's a stretch to, uh, to, uh, to say that it's a threat. We've heard from the apologists for the fossil fuel industry. So I apologize. But what do dedicated lifetime security professionals think about the threat from climate change? Uh, I just was part of a study that looked at the security impact of, an, of climate change for example. You know, some interesting things happen. The Arctic Sea melts. Now you've got a security problem. You've got five nations border the Arctic Sea. Everybody wants to get into the natural resources up there. We're going to have a, an Arctic fleet, U.S. fleet, Russian fleet, you know, Danish fleet, whatever, Canadian fleet. At a, a geopolitical level, climate change has affected uh, the concentration of ice in the Arctic. So that now we have uh, Russia, for example, that's planted a titanium flag on the North Pole and is claiming the North Pole and the Arctic for Russia. I think the quote of their explorer was, the uh, Arctic has always been uh, Russian. It will always remain Russian. And so as a result, Canada has increased its uh, icebreaker construction, and we now have to focus on an ice-free Arctic where 25% of the world's resources of oil and natural gas, according to USGS and GS, may be found. Uh, you have places where land loss creates major diasporas. Bangladesh goes away. Some other places go away. Where all those people go? You know, that creates a problem. You have loss of water resources, and so you have tra traumatized uh, uh, populations. There may be battles over water, which I think is going to be more the liquid of, of conflict than, say, oil uh, in the future. And so all this is tied together, energy, the environment. At a global level, there are tensions already created between the developing countries and the developed world over climate change. The overconsumption or the high per capita consumption of resources by the developed countries um, is an easily um, singled out problem in relations between North and South. So if the United States or European allies or Japan or the other developing developed countries uh, are not properly focused on addressing those mitigating strategies, price on carbon, for example, then we are portrayed negatively in the eyes of those that we need to influence to build goodwill and uh, uh, change. So let's just say the Muslim countries which are developing, um, it could easily be construed, and it has by Osama bin Laden, that the uh, West is uh, disregarding the impact of climate change on the developing world. Um, in my piece, the last third of it is a uh, uh, joint planning session for an energy policy for the United States between the ghost of John Muir and the ghost of George Patton. And Muir is only worried about carbon and thinks terrorism is something the FBI can deal with if anybody needs to. Patton uh, is only worried about terrorism and thinks uh, global warming is something some of these Birkenstock wearers cooked up, you know, in between tokes around the campfire or something. <laughs> And they don't agree at all on what they're trying, the problem they're trying to solve, but they keep finding that there's a very substantial degree of overlap in the things they want to do. Because insofar as you move toward distributed generation of electricity, because you're worried about the security of the web, terrorist attacks on the web and the like, uh, photovoltaics on the roof, put more effort into the de those technologies, Insofar as you're doing that, you're also going green because you can't put a coal-fired power plant on your roof, thank goodness. That's the type of IED that earned me a Purple Heart in Iraq six years ago. This is what our troops are up against today. It can penetrate four inches of armor. EFPs, specially designed to pierce American military armor. 
It's a devastating weapon, and it was created in oil-rich Iran. They're ending up in the hands of our enemies. And every time oil goes up a dollar, Iran gets another one and a half billion dollars to use against us. The connection between oil and the enemy couldn't be clearer. We need to break that connection by breaking our addiction. And we can by passing a clean energy climate plan. They'll cut our dependence on foreign oil in half. Some in Congress say it's a tough vote. Not as tough as what our troops are up against. Sometimes we persist in a behavior or a habit that no longer serves our best interest. There's a name for that. America is addicted to oil, which is often imported from unstable parts of the world. We know a behavior is an addiction when it causes us to do things that we don't want to do. I'm a retired Air Force officer. Before I retired, I saw up close what our dependence on oil actually causes us to do as a nation. I think this country can do a lot better than what we're currently doing. When we're trapped in an addiction, our survival may depend on how we respond to the world's wake-up calls. A gallon of uh, fuel to an airplane being refueled uh, any place, doesn't have to be in battle, any place, is $42 a gallon. Uh, a gallon of fuel in Afghanistan's in Kabul is about $15 a, a gallon. Now, that's not too bad, but a gallon of fuel to a forward operating base in Afghanistan is reportedly $1,000 a gallon. For in Secretary of the Navy Ray Mabus has uh, set a goal for the Navy, a very ambitious goal, to reduce our carbon-based fuels by 50 percent, 50 percent by the year 2020. Uh, this will give us much increased energy security, reduce our en energy vulnerability. In addition, it will very significantly reduce our greenhouse gas footprint. Today, the United States Navy is looking at fueling their ships with algae produced fuel. And when I first heard about algae as a fuel, I thought, well, that's pretty unique. Of course, on the other hand, that's where all oil comes from originally. But uh, the good news about algae uh, is uh, it's going to be plentiful. It's uh, uh, relatively clean to make. Uh, it burns a little better. It's got a better octane than regular fuel, and it doesn't have to have a new infrastructure to move it around. We're going to deploy, by 2016, a carrier strike group composed completely of alternatively powered ships, the great green fleet. Some people say the answer to our energy lies in the past. They want to burn more oil and more dirty coal. The problem is it burns carbon, and it's killing God's green earth. The future's over here. Wind, sun, a new energy grid. Imagine plugging in your pickup truck and driving all over hell's half acre on clean energy made right here in America. The boys in Tehran might not like it, but in Tucson, it's going down pretty good about now. The boys in Tehran may not like it. The boys at Fox News may not like it. And the boys from BP may not like it. So I apologize. But the world's people are weary of being held hostage at the gas pump of boom and bust manipulation, environmental disaster, endless wars for dwindling fossil resources, of being powerless to stop climate change and the destruction of our life support systems. And they're finally ready to wake up. When you pull into a filling station, if you should happen to hear on the radio the little eight-year-old Palestinian boy or a little eight-year-old uh, Pakistani boy has died as a suicide bomber, and you wonder, who is paying to teach those little boys at age eight to want to be suicide bombers. Who's running those, who's paying for those madrasas and so that are doing that? You don't need to do too much more than before you get out to charge your gas, turn the rear view mirror just a few inches so you're looking into your own eyes. Now you know who's paying for the other side of the war on terrorism.